Welcome to the Athlete's First Performance Podcast, where two performance-minded physical therapists break down the evidence to improve overall health, movement, and performance for athletes and active individuals. Welcome back to episode 20 of the Athlete's First Performance Podcast. Uh, today, we've got Coach Matt Matau on the podcast today, our first strength conditioning coach. He's a friend and coworker. So uh, welcome, Matt. Thanks for hopping on. Yeah, I appreciate the, the opportunity to be able to jump on. Yeah, it's going to be fun. So uh, for those that don't know you, why don't you give us a little background about you, where you're from, uh, where you went to school, where you grew up, and go from there. Got you. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm from Laie, Hawaii, little town on the North Shore of Oahu. And yep, currently here at Fort Liberty, working with the H2F program. Me and myself from one side of the nation all the way over. Uh, for school wise, did my master's program at Lindenwood University in St. Charles, Missouri. And then my bachelor's, where I actually played college football at, was at this little small town in Rolla, Missouri, which is like literally halfway between Kansas City. And St. Louis. When I say it was a small town, it was a small town. Yeah. So, and I actually got my bachelor's in biology because they didn't have a exercise science program. But hey, we made it work though. Yeah. How was that process going from Hawaii to a little town in Missouri? Humbling. Yeah. <laughs> How so did you find I that? Did, uh, uh, I did. Um, I did. Um, I did JUCO football at Palomar College in San Diego. Okay. So one. When I wanted to try it out, I did JUCO in San Diego. And then from JUCO, Missouri s &T hit me up. I was like a mid-year transfer. And it kind of just, it all aligned with my plans. So I went from sunny San Diego to snowy, slushy, Rolla, Missouri. I ain't never, I've never been to Missouri prior to that. The farthest west or east I've been was Utah. So I didn't okay. know what to expect. And then next, you know, I'm in Rolla, Missouri. And then that, that's where I like, I frog, like I frog hop my way to across the nation was Rolla, Missouri for college. And then Lindenwood for my GA and my first full time. Okay. Yeah. That's a big move. Hawaii to the Midwest. Um, <laughs> so when you, when you went to Missouri, did you know that you wanted to be a strength coach? What so, was your plan? I originally, when Back in, I think it was 2011, I got to spend some time around the University of Hawaii football team and their summer training, and I got to observe. And I remember seeing Tommy Heffernan, who I, don't, I think he's still there, but he was the strength and conditioning coach for the football team of the University of Hawaii. And I remember him running the show for summer workouts. And I, for me, I, it was like, it was so cool like to see him like be up there just orchestrating everything and it was cool to me too because he wasn't like he wasn't yelling at the guys and you could see that he was respected but he it was just like he was like talking to guys and he was like having fun doing his job and when I sat there and I observed and I was like people do this for a living like like this is a this is a legit thing so at that moment that's when I knew I wanted to be a strength coach okay. so shout out to uh, coach Tommy if you ever hear this yeah maybe we can tag him yeah. Listen to it. Um, is there a pretty big training culture in Hawaii? Like growing up playing high school football, is there a lot of weight, strength, conditioning, things like that? When I was in high school, high school level, no. It was a ragtag, like, hey, let's go hit let's go hit the weights after after practice. Hey, what are you doing for weights? Like, whatever coach says, it was it wasn't the most organized, at least at my high school. I can't speak for other schools. I went to Kuku High School. It's a public school. They do really good with football. Maybe this it's changed now, but at least when I was there, it was not as organized as like programs I've seen in the mainland. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I would hope it's I would hope it's a lot more developed just because um Hoku High School, they they what's it called? They actually play a lot of uh powerhouses mm -hmm. on the mainland, like Bishop Gorman. I think they're gonna play modern day. But well, my point being is, like, I would hope they're getting up to speed. But I don't know for the rest of the state of Hawaii. I'm not too sure. Okay. Yeah, there's definitely some blue-chip athletes that come out of Hawaii. Oh, yeah, most definitely. Yeah, no, that's awesome. All right, so played football. What position did you play? 
I played nose tackle, so it was a great job. I was 310. <laughs> All I had to do was eat up blocks, go left, go right, force double teams. And the defense we ran was a, it was a 3-4, so it was real okay. smoke and mirrors. So if the linebacker was getting through and getting sacks, then I was doing my job. Oh, I loved it. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. That's the same uh, defense that we played at Wofford 3-4. So. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, you know yeah. exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of movement in the back end. Front guys doing a lot of the work. So um, after your GA position, where did you go from there? So I got uh, – a funny story is I was ga in during the pandemic. During <laughs> – so during the pandemic, me and my fellow GAs, we got let go. But luckily, I made enough of a statement so that when things turned around, like in August of 2020, I got on as a full time. That's so awesome. my first full time gig was where I GA at, at Lindenwood University. Yeah, it was and a what? good gig, man. And they're D2, right? Yeah, they were D2 when I was there. And then now they are D1. Are they D1 for all sports now, like FCS level? Yes, they are FCS for most sports, but they also do have a big club sport presence. So I don't know how that works, but I know for most of the sports, yes, D1. Yeah, and there's some there's some NFL guys that come out of Lindenwood too. Oh, yeah. What do you call it? John Harris, he was – what's it called? He was over there um, this past year. I'm not too sure from the guys that I've worked with. But there's been a lot of guys who've like had like free agent deals or who've been had the opportunity to go to the next level and try it out for a bit. Yeah, I know when I was coming out of college, like a year or two or maybe the same year that I was coming out, they had a corner um, that was drafted in like the top maybe like three rounds. Was that Pierre Desir? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I I was able to be around him. He would come back to the university and like speak with the guys. I was able to observe that. And he seemed like a real, like, from my interactions and my observations, real cool and low-key guy. And with him, like, a lot of the guys, like, really respected him. And also, like, they responded well, if like, whenever he spoke. Yeah. No, that's awesome. It's, I always love to see the small school guys make it to the NFL, oh, being yeah. a small school guy myself. So, at Linden, what, what sports did you coach? When, um, when I was a full-time I was – I helped out with football. That was my primary, like, sub role. But the sports I was over was men and women's rugby, women's volleyball, and the track athletes, the sprint, the sprinters, hurdlers, jumpers, and pole vaulters. So those are the teams that I worked with. Okay, so, like, a lot of power athletes. Oh, yeah, a lot of power athletes. And then especially with uh, – it was the range and culture from sport to sport. It was good fun. Like, a lot of them definitely matched my tempo. Mm hmm. Yeah. So I always think it's interesting talking and working with strength coaches at the university level. They have to manage, like you're saying, the kind of the dichotomy of different teams. So like football might have a different culture than track and field or soccer and things of that nature. How did how did you handle that or how do you learn how to handle that uh, working with different teams at a school? So football was football was real natural for me because I played football. So if it came, when it came to like football culture, it wasn't anything to learn for me. And it was it was a sub role for me. Like when it came to like talking with football players and like getting to know their culture, it was easy. I didn't have to worry about that. When it came to rugby, uh rugby to me it meshed well. I their culture, like rugby culture was just a bunch of dudes, a bunch of girls who like to hit people on the pitch for 80 minutes mm -hmm. and who like to have fun. Like they definitely are a like they're a lactic like mentality, mm -hmm. like kill or be killed kind of thing. Yeah. So for me, it was I got along well with those guys. We had there was a lot of internationals that were on the team. So like the mentality and just like the vibe of the both teams, it was just for me, it was easy to mesh. Like just come in, learn about the sport. But when it came to like getting to know people, like I gravitated, it was easier for me to be able to do that. And especially the coaches that I worked with, the staff that I worked with at the time. They were real easy to they were real easy to like mesh with in regards to like mentality and like hey this is what this is what our goal is it was easy to mesh with them. The volleyball girls were like <laughs> they were good fun to work with too because yeah. they were just like they were high spirits, they were energetic, and like they were sassy. And to me, like I mesh well with that kind of personality in regards to like they they would come in and train. Like I would speak to them and like, hey, look, I didn't like you look at me. I'm not a volleyball player, but 
but I understand I know how to like break down the demands. And like and once I got to know the ladies, like it was good fun. Like it was easy to mesh with them too. And the coaching staff for the volleyball team was good. The track team too was like, I think a lot of people that have a hard time when it comes to like getting to know people, they don't spend enough time getting to actually know people. And with the track team, it's a very individual sport. So instead of like, yes, you got to get to know the team. But for me, what I saw that works is you have to more so get to know the person. So once I put like the like the football, like every other sport mentality, when I put it on the side and I got to know like track culture, it meshed well. And plus their their coach at the time was a real fun, fun guy to work with, Nicholson. I don't know where he's at now, but yeah, he was real like he was easy to work with. Okay. No, that's good. Yeah. I mean, definitely working with athletes or really anyone, like they don't really care how much you know until they know how much you care about them. Right. That's a quote that you hear all the time, but I mean, it rings true for anything that you're doing. You just have to put the effort in and get to know the people that you're working with. They'll respect you a lot more. And then they'll actually listen to what you know and what you program. Oh yeah. Yeah. I totally agree with that. And I feel like that applies to like, like every single aspect in life. And sure. I like, I get humbled over and over just because because like I like I think all of us we like to like flex how much we know, mm -hmm. but no one cares. Yeah, no one exactly. Cares. You can have all the letters behind your name, all the different certifications and courses, but if you don't know how to interact with people, it doesn't matter, right? Yeah, nobody cares. Yeah. yeah. So did you have a preference like as you were um getting your strength conditioning certification and going through school did you have a preference like hey i want to work with football like that's my sport that's all i want to do or did you want to branch out and work with other teams oh when i first started it i definitely had a preference uh i when i first started it was like football or nothing mm -hmm. right it was football or nothing but then when i started working with other sports that's when i realized oh there are more sports that out there that I like that I thoroughly enjoy. Football for me was always like at one point in time, it was definitely a goal. But all of a sudden I started working with the rugby guys and I'm like, man, I'm not gonna lie, like I really enjoy working with rugby. And all of a sudden I started working with like the volleyball girls. And I'm like, oh man, this is good fun too. So after I started getting exposed to more sports, then I realized there's more like there's more to the world than there is just football. Same thing with tactical. When I got exposed to tactical, and I recognized like where I can fit in. I was like, oh, so there's more to the world than just sports. So yes, and but also like, oh, on the on the fly, I'm like, oh wow, there is more. Yeah, I'm pretty much the exact same way. Like grew up playing football, that was my sport. I was like, yeah, that's my goal. I want to go work with college or NFL football players. And then you get to work with soccer players, basketball players, and you get to mesh with them and learn the demands of their sports. And you know, hey, this is a cool thing too. Um, so how did you get into tactical? Like, did you know that was something, was that always something that you had in the back of your head or is it just like a job opening that you saw? Where was that transition? Oh man. So I remember this at my, um, at, when I was working at Lindenwood, I was aware of a couple guys who made the jump to tactical and someone I trust, his name is Travis Pelletier. He was the football strength and conditioning coach at Lindenwood when I first got there. And he made the jump to seventh group down in Destin. So I was aware of it. And all of a sudden, I started seeing all these articles pop up about tactical strength and conditioning. So I reached out to Travis and I asked him about it. I was interested in it because I think anybody who has been in the college game or the sport game knows that it's a it's a beast of its own, like. And the one thing that made attracted me to the tactical was the fact that I know these four P's get thrown around thrown around a lot with uh, strength and conditioning, was that there's better pay in tactical. You actually there's a set schedule, so you're not grinding Sunday through Monday or Sunday through Sunday, so you have a personal life. Progress and tactical was on the board just because it's such a new thing. But there was also purpose because you're helping out the servicemen of the United States uh, Army. So those three things really stuck out to me. And I think if you've worked in the college game, you understand that 
especially with like sports like football or if you're like around the clock, there's not really a lot of personal life. Especially if you have, especially if you have like dreams of being a family, it's kind of like, how do you balance that? Luckily, I was single at the time, like when I was doing Lindenwood. But now that I, now that I have a family, I I I wanted stability. I wanted time to be actually around my family. So that's when all of a sudden I see all these tactical strength and conditioning jobs popping up. And that's when I was like, okay, I need to reach out to Travis. And that's when I reached out to Travis. And I remember Travis was telling me, he's like, hey, you know what's nice is when I get to go work and I get to come home and I get to see my sons. Like I get to see, like I get to be there and help them grow up. So for me, that's what stuck out to me. And that's like I'm all of a sudden when these jobs started popping up, that's some of the motivating factors that make the jump. No, I like that a lot. I think um, all the professionals that are moving into tactical feel the same way. I know speaking to people that are in the sports medicine side, the performance side, um, sports psych, dietetics, like the sports world is a grind, right? Especially as you move up into the higher levels, D1, professional, like it's nonstop, go, go, go. And like you said, the job security, especially if you're attached to like a, a coach at a big time school, if you have a couple of bad years, a coach gets fired, you might be doing a great job as a coach, but hey, you're attached to that coach, a new coach comes in, they bring in their guys. So there's a lot of uh, job security issues um, in that world. I think, and even there, this was something like, so I, I got cousins and I got like, I know people who are coaches at like some D1 programs and I see the trend, right? Like. It all depends on what you want, at least from my observations. And we even got some, uh, we have some strength coaches on the staff right now here at uh, 18th Fab who are prior D1. And what I see is a lot of them, like a lot of guys, if you were trying to do the family thing, and this is from me speaking to my uh, family members who are coaches right now in D1 football programs, not strength coaches, but like uh, position coaches at D1 football. It's a different, the family dynamic is different. It's like you got, when it comes to like managing family life, it's a grind. And a lot of them have told me that like, hey, one, you need to make sure your wife's on board. And two, like you, there's going to be so much that like you, you have to literally integrate your family into the program. And for like strength coaches, position coaches for the most part make money. Strength coaches, not so, uh, not so much on the D1 football thing. And if you're going to make money, you have to be at a P5. But other than that, like, if you're going to be at a school in the middle of nowhere and you're with your family, like, then what? So for me, tactical was uh, a lot more attractive to me. Yeah. And then what was that transition like as you got into the tactical world coming from a university level? Um, how was that integrating strength conditioning into that tactical side? Uh, strength and conditioning with tactical side. I'm very thankful that I had the strength, the strength staff that we had at 18th Fab. Also with uh, Jason, because our program director, Jason Pompili. And the reason I say that is because it helped level out my realities of the situation. So with in regards to implementing stuff with the, in H2F or tactical, I learned that you're not, in, you're not in college anymore. The type of athlete you're working with is different. And I know even soldiers, they they well for my like conversations is like they just like being referred to as soldiers i've heard some say like i've heard some people refer to soldiers as tactical athlete but i even speaking with like soldiers they do we're just soldiers so they, the training needs are different there's no like game day so there's no seasons right it's like the everlasting in season you're just trying to make sure guys are ready to go all the time like you're what's the goal hey make sure your overall health and fitness like they're good they're good to go anytime they're on the drop of the dime. There's, you're not trying to you're not trying to peak them for uh, like a game for a season. You're trying to just keep them in shape all the time, all the time. Yeah, I think that's uh, what a lot of people are learning as they move into the tactical world. You can't bring your football strength conditioning program and expect them to execute that at a high level and even enjoy it, right? Yeah. So I think that's what a I lot mean, of people <laughs> have done in the past and are are finding out like, hey, this is not the right way to do it. No, no. And I think I think you see it, too, is where those who do make the transition, but they're stuck in their ways, they like malfunction. And it's like to me, it's like the funniest thing, because then you when I hear like ex college guys in tactical and they start like griping about it, I'm like, yo, my man, like, yeah, make the transition or if not, you're just gonna be another like 
you just give me one of those strength coaches. Like, oh, you know, when I was at da 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 da, it's like, dude, you're not there anymore. Yeah, exactly. Be present where you are. Understand what you need to do and execute that way. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So, getting a little bit more technical, like, do you think it's important to know the demands of what the soldier or the athlete has to do as you're programming? Absolutely. Um, I think that when in regards to like needs analysis and on like demands of the job, yes, I feel like that's applicable to any, like any time with like physical, like human performance, it's different because you don't want to like, you don't want to prepare somebody for something that they're not going to be doing. So in regards to soldiers, like we're the 18th, we're at our job, we're 18th fab guys, they drive trucks around and they shoot rockets, right? So I just need to make sure that they're good, like general health and fitness, that they're good. And how we achieve that goal, that's the magic where the sauce is at. But in regards to like this, like their general goal, their general thing is they drive trucks around, shoot rockets, and that's it. So if they need to be able to general fitness, be able to carry heavy loads, then they're good. And that makes my job easy. So like if that's their needs, like that's their demands, as long as we suffice it, we're good. And then there's a lot of talk about the ACFT, which is the Army Combat Fitness Test. There's a lot of people that talk about you shouldn't train for the test, right? So how do you manage training the soldiers for what they need to do in regards to their job, but also managing their PT test and making sure that they're able to complete that safely and effectively? I got you. So the, what I was able to do with the units I've worked with is when you look at the test itself, it just covers the basic attributes of like the yeah, strength, power, endurance, um, aerobic capacity, or tomorrow it could be a capacity or capability, depending on how you look at it. But it covers all the broad things of just general fitness. So in our training programs, we covered all the broad things in uh, all those characteristics in the training program. So if if I'm getting the guys ready for trap bar deadlift, like the 3RM and the ACFT, as long as I'm building up something like a variation of it or a different like one-offs from it, then we're going to improve on it. And you got to look at the type of demographic we're working with. Whereas like a lot of the guys, maybe the training ages are so low. Like they are before when they just did the regular uh, PT test, they're not accustomed to like neuromuscular wise. They don't have those uh, pathways to like even trap bar deadlift, but we throw them like on a program and then they're going to jump up big time. So just general fitness, like the programs all that I use, if as long as I cover an aspect of the test in it, it carried over well. And also the the soldiers we work with, we got a whole range of physical capabilities. I got 18-year-old guys. I got a 51-year-old chaplain, you know. I got people who've been jumping out of planes, their knees and their lower backs are messed up. I got guys who played Call of Duty, and all of a sudden they just got out of basic training. So the range, as long as we kept it general and covered like microdose those aspects of like physical characteristics, I was good. I think that's one of the hardest parts because you're training a large group of people every morning. And like you said, there's a huge spectrum of people, some really good athletes, prior high school, college athletes and versus the, the new guy that hasn't trained at all in their life. So what's that like in terms of managing a big group like that? For me, it was a it was a reality check at first because going from college, for the most part, everyone in college, when people arrive at your school or their sport, they're there because of the sport. So they've had many years of like training, or they're there because they're athletic. They are like they have those athletic capabilities. Whereas when it comes to the soldiers that I've been able to work with, there's a big spectrum of cap uh, like physical capability. And I think strength coaches, when they come in, they get pigeonholed into thinking that, like, oh, when I was here, it's going to be like this. No, no, no. These guys were these guys were brought here to do soldier things. Yeah. So take that athletic mindset. Like, they can still do athletic things, but you got to remember the primary thing is to do soldier things. They may not have had to do goblet squats or back squats. Like, is that really important? Like, don't as long as you do, they can do their soldier job. Like, as, as long as you can do it, their MOS, like, they're good to go. Your back squat or whatever you're trying to get is just icing on the cake. 
And I always see like sometimes people like some strength coaches in tactical, they'll they'll highlight the the guys who like love to work out outside of it, which is good. But what about the rest of the battery in the company? Like, what about the guys who don't like to work out? How are they doing? So yeah, it makes you think. Yeah. I feel like it's just ultimate like GPP, right? Just getting them ready for everything, hit the different physical characteristics and making sure that you're not just putting all your emphasis on strength and power, right? Because that's what we like, especially coming from the football world. It's all strength and power. But what about that (laughs) aerobic side, right? So I think for me, one of the hardest things in terms of like rehab and training is just for like all the running that they have to do, right? So how have you managed that? Like those long distance runs. I think that's especially for me, like I'm always learning how to improve like running mechanics, running injury rehab and reconditioning and things of that nature. James, when I got into working tactical, I didn't realize how much it's a cultural thing with the running concept, the long distance running concept. Okay. Speed, power, strength. I got that. When it came to programming, conditioning, I know people will talk about like interference, da 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 da. But at the end of the day, these soldiers got to run. Like running long distance, running, it ain't going nowhere. Mm-hmm. At least it's me, from what I observe. So then it's like, okay, we need to get them strong, but we always they got to be able to run because I don't think brigade runs are leaving anytime soon, especially yeah. at pace. So it's either we adjust our expectations of like power development and strength development. But at the end of the day, we need to make sure these guys get hang in the, in the brigade run. So being able to program a uh, distance running into it was like a big eye opener. Yeah, for sure. And then um, I see this a lot, just helping people understand that every time you run, it doesn't have to be your PR, like a max effort, right? You're, you're trying to hit different capabilities for your runs. So you can't just try to max out your four mile run every week because you're not ever going to improve and you're probably going to get hurt. So how has that been trying to educate people, especially people that have been in this culture for so long, um, trying to kind of rewrite the the workouts and understand that, hey, this is how you improve your run times without running yourself into the ground. I got you. Uh, The one thing that one. Me being a big guy. If I'm going to talk to these, what I, this is from my experience, is when I would talk to these guys about running, okay, so, soldiers, from my experience, are show me, don't tell me. So the one time I did the two-mile run for the ACFT, I died, okay? <laughs> I can do tempo runs. I'll do any of that. But when it comes to, like, long-distance running, I remember, I remember the sergeant that called me out. And the one thing about it, though, is like my athletic, I'm, I'm like, I'm competitive. I was like, all right, I'm going to do it. I'll do it. Let's do it. Like, so I died. But you know what? After that, people started listening to me because they knew that I was willing to suffer. So if if you want people to listen to you in tactical, if you want soldiers to listen to, listen to you, you got to be able to throw down. Mm-hmm. Okay. A side note, I do jujitsu downtown. And there are some of the swords, some of the swick guys go over there. And they told me straight up, they go, man, I'm not going to lie. You a big guy, but you're out here rolling with all of us throwing down. It's nice to see that just because we like they've worked with strength coaches in the tactical center who like they don't look the part. Yeah, exactly. So if you're a strength coach in tactical and you want people to listen to you, you got to be able to throw down. There have been times during the workout where they're like, Matt, you come deadlift. You come deadlift this then. And I had to like step over and like deadlift the bar cold just to prove a point. And then all of a sudden, like, oh, okay, 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 I'll listen yeah. to you. <laughs> yeah. Or like I had to do sprints. I had to do like running just to prove a point. And like, oh, okay, okay, Matt's out here suffering too. Like, I don't, if you want people to listen to you in a tactical setting, you got to be able to throw down. Yeah. And then apply the science. They don't care what the science is, they don't care about any of that stuff. The only thing they want to care about is like, oh, Matt, you're a big guy. Why aren't you out here running? Next thing you know, I'm out there running. We'll do like, I run, what's it called? We'll do sprints on Friday Mm -hmm. workouts. And they're like, oh, okay, I'll listen to Matt. Yeah. No, I think that's awesome. It uh, develops a good culture, buy-in. And then, like you said, they respect you a lot more. And now what are you doing? You're training for some running, aren't you? 
Yeah, I got a 10K. I got planned 18 weeks to 10K. It's a yeah. real slow cooker approach. But yeah, so I don't, I don't like you ever seen strength coaches who are bald with beards and they're just big. I am not yeah. like, dude, we, we got to take the cholesterol out of strength and conditioning. We got to put the conditioning back in the strength and conditioning. Man. Yeah, I saw you post that on uh, Instagram a couple of weeks ago and I thought that was awesome. Yeah, not a lot of people would put themselves out there to do that and start a 10k program i did a 5k about a month ago and i died james yeah i hate running but you know what i hate more is being a hypocrite so exactly so you're doing it you're doing the thing that's awesome um so kind of going into our next question like what other advice would you give for a up-and-coming strength coach that's looking to get into tactical experience get experience don't get your master's if you don't need to get it. If you're going to tactical, don't get your master's if you don't have to get it. Having a master's is good in college, but the experience you get from actually coaching is a lot more carryover than the master's program itself. Get it if you can, but don't make it an emphasis. Also, like, be around people. Be around, like, I advocate for internships and all that because you have to be around people who challenge your beliefs and things. And you have to be able to implement those things that you learned. Because if you're just one way, I'm thankful where I'm around coaches who like have been experienced with a lot of things. So they're not stuck in their ways. But I'm also like, it's you got to be able to adapt. Like if you're just one way with your training and you apply that with soldiers, it's, it's not going to carry over well. Um, do you think it'd be helpful to get like an internship program for uh, coaches to run through different H2F programs or just check out how the army works? Oh, absolutely. So one that they know, they know what uh, they're getting into. I think a lot of strength coaches coming up from college for, if there is any turnover is because they, the gap of the gap between expectations and reality was big. So when they come to the, when they actually come to tactical, the reality is skewed from what they pictured in their mind. I think tactical has a big, it has big, like, opportunity to solidify in, in regards to like making a system and come up and coming i just think right now it's it's in its infancy phases where it needs a lot of help to be nourished and it, it needs to be nourished it needs to be taken care of it's just going to take a while to get there yeah i mean this is all a learning curve for most of us in regards to the h2f program itself it's only a couple of years old and people are coming into it without any experience in the military. So I know it took me a good six months to figure out what was going on before <laughs> even just like talking to people. Cause the whole language that the army uses is very different. All the acronyms and things of that nature. So oh. it's a whole different world than like a private sector or university job. Yeah. Cough, footprint, uh, CAC, all these like acronyms. It's just like, it's like the culture, right? It, mm -hmm. To this day, I'm still trying to figure things out. I, I would like to say it's better than a year ago, but I'm still trying to figure things out. Yeah, for sure. And I definitely agree with what you said, that it's only going to get better from here. Um, they're putting more resources into the programs. Uh, people are getting more experience. New ideas are popping up. So I would definitely recommend for performance professionals uh, look into uh, the tactical setting because it's just going to keep on getting better and better. Yeah, I agree with you. Any other closing thoughts in regards to human performance, strength, conditioning before we uh, end the podcast? Learn a lot, coach a lot, and I just have fun with it, man. Just have fun with it. Like, I don't know. Like, the whole reason we got into the job was because it was fun. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, just try to have fun with it. Don't take it too seriously. Know <laughs> no, your stuff. No know your stuff, work well with people. Don't take it too seriously. Yeah. We're definitely replaceable. Like every coach is replaceable. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. dude, just have some fun. Like it's a good job. We get yeah, the worst. Sure. We're, we're gonna exactly. Stay. No, it's, it's been a lot of fun. I've been here for two years now and it, it's been great learning a lot. Um, getting to work with a whole bunch of different people, um, strength coaches, the human performance team, um, couldn't ask for a better team. I think we've got a really good thing going. Yeah, especially shout out to Jason Pompili up in the, like it all starts from the top. And well, I think that's something that I don't want his head to get big if he ever listens to this, but I think that's something we all can recognize is that he's a great program director. For sure. He's got a lot of experience, a lot of high level programs. So he's just uh, bringing it down uh, throughout the staff. Oh, yeah.
All right. So if anyone wants to get in touch with you, what are some good ways uh, for people to contact you? Just hit up my Instagram, uh, Instagram handle at Matthew period F period Matau. And that's the best way to, uh, that's the best way to get in reach with me. Okay. Yeah, for sure. And I'll make sure to put that in the show notes. So if anyone's listening, go ahead and check out those show notes and uh, that link will be in there. Yep. All right, Matt. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, really enjoyed the conversation and I'm sure I'll see you around pretty soon. Yep. Hi, right, James. All right. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Athletes First Performance Podcast. If you have any questions regarding this episode or future episodes, please be sure to reach out on social media or our website. Both links can be found in the show notes.